Okay, so in our last episode, we talked about site prep and vine planting. And in today's companion episode, we're talking about the considerations and actions for new vineyards or new vineyard blocks in those critical three months after planting the vine. So joining me today is my good friend and fellow viticulturist, Mark Chen from Pennsylvania. Welcome to the podcast, Mark. Yeah, thanks, Fritz. Good to be here. Yeah. So Mark, we've known each other for a long time. I consider you a dear friend and you've been very instrumental, not only in the wine industry, both in Pennsylvania and Oregon and otherwise, but you've been influential in my career because when I met you, I was a a young graduate student. I'm not going to say how many years ago that was. We don't want to date ourselves, but uh, at Penn State, and you had just started recently as the viticulture extension specialist at Penn State. And man, you couldn't have come at a better time. So uh, why don't you, this is a good opportunity maybe for you to talk about your background in viticulture and and your journey and where you, uh, how you found yourself where you are today back in Pennsylvania. Okay. Thanks, Fritz. Um, Great to be here. And uh, thank you for asking me. Um, So yeah, basically in high school and college, I spent about three years total in Germany. And that's where I got interested in grapes and wine. Um, then, uh, I had a psych degree from a small New England liberal arts school, but then, um, I found this fascination with, uh, vineyards. So I asked, just asked around and, you know, people said, go west, young man, to, uh, Davis, California, of all the unforsaken places. Right. So I enrolled in the, uh, master's viticulture program there. Um, so studied there for almost two and a half years, but left actually before I got my degree to, uh, take a job on Long Island. So, uh, started out, spent three years on Long Island at, at Pindar Vineyards, then, uh, was asked to, uh, manage a vineyard by a friend in the Willamette Valley called Temperance Hill. Uh, and so I spent 16 years at Temperance Hill. So, um, really almost about 20 years of actual grape growing, um, uh, uh, sort of informed my knowledge of viticulture, but always a close connection with extension at any land grant. So Cornell on, on Long Island and then Oregon State uh, uh, University in Oregon. Then uh, um, uh, decided to try research and extension. So I uh, got a job at Penn State and eventually became the uh, state extension viticulturist at Penn State. And I spent about 16 years doing that. Uh, then went to Oregon State, uh, uh, to the Oregon Wine Research Institute at, at OSU and spent five years there. So really my career sort of divided 20 years as a grower and 20 years in research and extension and, uh, retired, uh, last year and started a teensy, teensy weensy, uh, viticulture consulting business that, uh, uh, Fritz could rub out with his pinky. Let's presume the vines are already acclimated and they're planted properly and they're going to start growing. What, what is a grower? Let's just say if you're talking to your new grower and they're saying, what's going to happen next? When do these things start growing? What should I expect? What do you tell them to look for first? Before um, that question is asked, Fritz, uh, I just want to emphasize that the goal of, uh, of the vineyard manager owner at this point is really uh, to create a, uh, healthy on uh, a growing environment for the plant. And, um, I really call it the TLC phase, these first three years, just, um, you've got to give each plant a lot of tender, loving chairs and nurture it. So it gets uh, a little bit more mature and can withstand some of the rigors of, uh, you know, uh, just growing wherever it is. So, um, you really want to emphasize relieving stress on the vine. Uh, that's just, uh, so important. And so I think the first thing that you're looking for, of course, once that uh, vine is in the ground is, um, bud break. So, um, you know, hopefully you get 100% take on your, uh, plants, whether they're own rooted or, or grafted, but, um, so you want to look for shoots on every vine and, uh, if there aren't shoots, then uh, hopefully you have some, uh, um, extra, um, nursery stock that you can, uh, use to, uh, plant vines that, uh, just, uh, for one reason or other did not take. So I think, uh, um, this is your first opportunity to, in your, um, 
in your goal of creating as much uniformity and synchronicity in your vineyard as possible. So, um, you know, every vine should be, um, alive and, uh, have, uh, a productive future in front of it. I think those are, would be my main early goals. And so, so the grower at this point, um, whether they know what they're doing completely or not, they've got these vines in the ground. And one, one of the things that I always get a question about Marcus, you know, what's the first thing I do? Like, when do I touch the vine? You know, so mm -hmm. let's imagine the vines in the ground, there's maybe a, a training stake, preferably a metal training stake, a rebar or a pencil rod metal, something that's got some, some longevity. To it. And uh, they either have a protective grow tube on it or they don't, depending on their climate and their philosophies. And if they're going to be using herbicides or if they're protecting the, the plant from rabbit feeding or something like that. Um, but either way. What are the, what's the first thing they're going to do in their vine training, the first touch point on that vine? And, and, and you could even go into how would that differ from a warm climate to a cool climate or different regions? Right. Yeah. So, so yeah, there's some very critical questions uh, that need to be uh, addressed before, uh, you know, you really enter into that training process. So I think one of them, especially here in the East is, um, uh, are you wanting to use one trunk or two. So yes. we, winter injuries, injury is still a huge uh, issue here. And uh, most proponents, uh, uh, two trunks are still a, a good choice. And believe me, mm -hmm. um, I've seen enough vineyards uh, with winter injury and gaps in the, in the rows that uh, mm -hmm. uh, I think if they had had two trunks, uh, they would have been able to uh, keep up with their production. Then, you know, I learned at Davis that you, so you're going to get a vine from the nursery that chances are has, uh, um, you know, a two to uh, four to five bud uh, uh, spur on it. So you have to decide you know, whether you're going to just uh, um, uh, train up one trunk or two or three. Uh, at Davis, we learned, and now, now I'll date myself, for uh, um, it's that this was in the 80s, you, the um, way that uh, they developed vineyards in California was to let the vine bush for that first uh, uh, year. In other yeah, words, just let so all the buds bush, don't touch it at all. and get Everything, it yeah, yeah, pushes. And essentially uh, what you're doing is you're committing yourself to develop your root system. So you're developing as much leaf area as you possibly can. Um, I would say the tendency that now and you know, you can weigh in on this is people to really start training in that first year. So they will disbud to, um, you know, one to two, two shoots. Well, I always recommend two because you always need an insurance policy in case sure. that's just practical bit of culture in case something goes away. Um, you know, how are you going to, uh, cover, uh, its absence. So decide on the number of trunks and then, uh, you know, the first touch point is really if, uh, mm -hmm. the, the first time you either start to dip on or you start to train up the training stake. And please, 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 please don't, do not use string at, uh, as a uh, training support mechanism. Yeah. Uh, bamboo is sort of okay, but if I come in a vineyard and I see pencil rods, uh, then I know the person is serious about establishing a, a, a good vineyard. Would you say that the majority of the vineyards you've worked with in your career, Mark, have been dry farmed uh, or, or some with irrigation, some without? What is the percentage there? Yeah, in Oregon, we did have uh, two blocks that were drip irrigated. And, and um, yeah, irrigation is just a horrific and almost indispensable tool to have um, for, for a variety of reasons. That said, I would say that overall, as I look back on my career farming, we spent, I spent more time troubleshooting irrigation than just about anything else. Sometimes it seemed like I spent the whole day outside just, you know, fixing problems with irrigation. And some of the worst, most challenging problems I had, you know, were re related to irrigation, uh, either um, the electrical system, uh, plumbing, of course, and because it's underground, most of it's underground, you know, troubleshooting that becomes uh, even more Difficult. We once had a, a, a mouse caught in a valve, underground valve. And I'll tell you, 
you know, I have never been able to figure out how a mouse got into the, um, actually the plumbing system. Uh, so all kinds of weird things can happen, you know, emitters pop out, uh, a rodents chew on the drip line, just, just everything. That said, happy irrigation, especially in a young vineyard can really help because then, you know, eat, water is one of the three essentials. Um, uh, so just so important. And then you have the option to fertigate if you want to. Uh, so in, in many ways, it's an indispensable tool, but also, uh, you know, a real hassle for, for all growers. Uh, in California, they live and die by irrigation in many other areas. So and they yeah. definitely know how to do it. I, 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 w I was an amateur uh, irrigator, I'll have to say, you know, when it came to uh, irrigation scheduling, soil moisture mon monitoring, plant uh, water status monitoring and stuff like that. I was I, I was a real rookie, um, but uh, we had some. Pe I knew some people who were just unbelievably talented at irrigating. 